station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, I am ready for the event. ESA, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. ISS, this is Denmark. DTU, can you hear us? Hello, I've got you loud and clear, and welcome to the International Space Station. Thank you very much. Hi, Andreas. Thank you for uh, taking time to speak with us today. We're around uh, 1,000 people today. Can you tell us, where are you currently? Uh, we are somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean, flying uh, southeast uh, down towards South Africa before we turn northeast again over uh, Southeast Asia. So somewhere over the Atlantic. Sweet. As an astronaut, part of your job is to conduct experiments and collect data for various research projects. Is there a project that you have done on your mission that has made a particular impression on you? Well, we have so many uh, high technology experiments up here uh, that uh, the you know every day is is exciting. Um, one of my uh, uh, experiments that I'm very fascinated in is the 3D metal pr metal printer that you've been discussing today. Um, but we also have something a little bit different, though similar, called the biofabrication facility, which essentially is a 3D printer for human tissues. And that's one of the experiments we've also been working on. Uh, and we're trying to print uh, human tissues uh, or simulants of uh, organs even. And the idea being that maybe in the future, uh, we will be able to print human organs and use that for transplants instead of relying on uh, organ donors. So uh, some very, very fascinating uh, high technology experiments that we're doing up here. Things are indeed moving fast here on stage. We just talked to John about making a screwdriver and now you're talking about human organs. It's a pleasure to watch science in action. But my question in the in the in my panel in the panel here, we discussed uh, your experiments with VR. Um, in your own words, how has it been using this VR headset to sort of uh, go to another place than the ISS while you've been there? Yeah, it's actually one of my favorite uh, activities on board the space station, using this VR headset. Uh, I use it for, for two things. One is for mental health, where I have a chance to uh, relax, uh, enjoy a scene of, uh, from nature on Earth, and just kind of de-stress, uh, catch my breath. Um, and the second thing I use it for is uh, exercising. It uh, can uh, be combined with our bicycle on uh, the space station, and then I can bike five different routes in Denmark, including a mountain bike trail in Silkeborg, uh, a trail around the lakes in central Copenhagen, um, a trail along the beach in Jutland. And it's, it's absolutely one of my favorite things to do because it makes me feel like I'm out in nature uh, riding on my bike rather than sitting on a stationary bicycle on board the uh, uh, space station. It's also a lot more motivating because it's tied in with the, uh, the uh, mechanical uh, system of the bicycle. So when I when it looks like I'm biking uphill, I feel uh, that I need to put in more power into the pedals. And when I'm biking downhill inside the VR headset, I f it, it becomes easier. And so it's coupled together that way for a really immersive experience that is just, it takes me out of the space station and puts me into nature. And I love it. So two follow-up questions to that. Um, how do you feel it has affected you? And do you keep the headset to yourself or do you let your colleagues use it also? Well, it certainly uh, improves my uh, mental health, I would say, and also just my um, just daily life up here because I feel like I get to, to go out into nature once in a while. And uh, my crewmates have tried it. Uh, they can also use it, and uh, they love it as well. It, it really makes, especially biking, uh, much more pleasant. Rather than sitting staring into a blank wall and trying to motivate yourself, uh, this, this really makes a huge difference.
And now, of course, all your colleagues can see our beautiful country and beautiful biking routes. I'm curious, um, the current comfort level on the space station, or maybe lack thereof, um, could you give a guesstimate of how long you would say you could reasonably stay in space? Well, it's difficult to say because I think humans are remarkably resilient. Uh, we uh, are capable of much more than we uh, imagine on a on a daily basis. So I don't think that we as humans will be the weakest link when we uh, are exploring space. Um, now, having said that, there's a difference between surviving and living. And uh, having virtual reality uh, that lets you imagine or feel like you're back on Earth, feel like you're back with your family or feel like you're back uh, in nature can really improve uh, sort of your, your, your mental well-being, your, your uh, psychological well-being, and I think can, can do a, uh, make a tremendous uh, improvement overall. So it's definitely something that, uh, that we can use. Um, I just spoke to John, and he was very, uh, very uh, excited about 3D printing. Um, do you have any updates for for John? How is his his 3D printer? Well, the good news, I was able to successfully install it in our Columbus laboratory this week, so it is all uh, set to go. Uh, what we're now waiting for is a checkout and commissioning phase, uh, which will be run primarily from our uh, European Columbus uh, Control Center located just outside of Munich. Uh, that checkout and commissioning phase will probably take uh, a couple of weeks, meaning that most likely, unfortunately, I'll be back on Earth before uh, we're ready to actually print something. But it just means that uh, I'll be able to follow along from Earth and, and see the next crew expedition uh, 71 get a chance to, to actually do the printing, but uh, otherwise the, the the printer is set up and it's ready to go to get checked out. We trust that some of your colleagues will bring home prints for John. Um, you touched upon it just before about um, expectations and 3D printing potentially of human organs, but sticking to the metal, what what do you what are your expectations concerning that technology when it comes to space? Well, that certainly is a uh, a potential big game changer for uh, spaceflight. Uh, on board the International Space Station, we are very reliant on resupply uh, from Earth. Uh, at least once a month or every two months, uh, we receive a cargo vehicle. Um, and on that cargo vehicle is a lot of spare parts. You know, the space station is incredibly uh, a co an incredibly complex structure with lots of mechanical, electromechanical components that just tend to get worn down over time, which means that we spend a lot of our time maintaining these systems and repairing these systems and replacing uh, parts that are worn out or broken. Um, you know, to truly explore uh, deep space, if we want to go to the moon for long periods of time, and especially if we want to go to Mars, uh, we have to be much more self-sufficient, which also means being able to produce our own spare parts, and metal 3D printing is a key technology there. Um, but it goes beyond human spaceflight. Um, you know, if, if, if satellites um, could print, for example, large booms or solar arrays, that will also uh, lift the restriction on size, because satellites, anything we launch into space, is restricted by the size of the fairing on top of a rocket. And so metal 3D printing, or 3D printing in general, can really... Um, enhance what we can achieve and what we can do uh, when it comes to space exploration. Um, going over to another one of your projects, the um, the photography thing, the Tort Davies project, uh, we've seen some of your amazing footage. Can you elaborate on some of the challenges with capturing these phenomena? Well, that's another uh, fascinating experiment uh, that I, I love to do. Uh, and it uh, involves this small camera here, uh, a, a Davis camera. Uh, now, I mount that because it doesn't have a, a view screen or a viewfinder. I, I mount that on top of a, a regular Nikon camera. Um, and then I sit in cupola. And uh, I hope 
that I get to see uh, a big thunderstorm. It's uh, it's always exciting because you never know what you're going to see. Sometimes it's it's a very small thunderstorm with just a few lightning, and other times you get out there and it's just an enormous uh, thunder system with lightning going off uh, in all the windows. Uh, and really, the the most difficult part is choosing where to point the camera uh, sometimes because there's just lightning flashes everywhere, and you just kind of have to cross uh, you know cross your fingers and hope that uh, you're pointing the camera in the absolute best direction and you're going to capture one of those elusive red sprites or blue jets. So um, besides just being fascinating and pretty uh, photos, how does this data actually um, inform climate research, you think? Well, on, on one level, it's... Um, what you could call uh, basic research, right? It's about understanding uh, the planet that we live on and the atmosphere. This is a, a phenomenon that's not well understood. Uh, and so anything we learn about it is going to make us uh, smarter about our planet and, and the atmosphere. But more uh, specific to your question, um, we tend to view weather phenomenon as being isolated to the troposphere. Uh, Above the troposphere is the stratosphere. Usually we don't see weather phenomena up there, uh, but these giant lightning strikes um, are a way for weather phenomenon to uh, occur in the stratosphere and to move gaseous uh, molecules from the troposphere up into the stratosphere. For example, water vapor. And water vapor is a, a very strong uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, and so this is a uh, potentially something that we need to understand better uh, and to account for in our climate models if we want to uh, better understand uh, our climate and, and how it evol evolves and how it's impacted uh, by things like lightning. I know it's an impossible task to choose among your favorite children, but if you should, um, what, is, what is the most important contribution you hope that your research has, on the ISS has been? Well, I would say it's a little abstract, but I think the most important thing that we're doing up here is preparing for the future, for a better future, um, a future where we are much more knowledgeable, uh, much more insightful, uh, but also have uh, a much broader horizon. Um, we're up here doing scientific research to improve knowledge, but at the same time, we're also pushing uh, the boundary of you know, human civilization. Uh, I hope that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, that we will see humans um, on the moon and potentially uh, even on Mars. Um, so that's really what I'm hoping that my work on board the International Space Station uh, is leading towards, is, is uh, a future, a, a better future, a brighter future, uh, but also a future where humans um, are exploring space uh, further and deeper than we've done so far. Obviously being on the space station is an amazing adventure for lack of better word, but what do you look forward to in your job professionally uh, when you get back to Earth? Well, this is an incredibly exciting time uh, in space exploration, not just human uh, space exploration, but in general. And so I look forward to uh, getting back to the Earth and, and continuing to support um, our upcoming missions, especially as we return to the Moon uh, with the Artemis missions. Um, you know, there's a, a very good chance that we'll see a European astronaut uh, as part of uh, an Artemis mission to the Moon. And I think that's incredibly exciting that we as Europe, that the next generation of Europeans will have a, uh, a chance to explore the Moon. Uh, and so, you know, basically, uh, supporting that in whatever role I can, uh, either as an astronaut or as an engineer. That's what I'm uh, particularly looking forward to. Okay, we do have a bit of time before uh, we have some questions from students. I'm curious, as you're about to leave the space station, what will you miss about your everyday life on board the ISS? Well, uh, a lot of things, for example, this. You know, be, being able to fly, being uh, weightless is just so much fun. 
Um, but otherwise, I'm going to really miss uh, looking out of the window. Uh, sitting in Cupola, looking at our beautiful planet is one of the most spectacular and breathtaking things that we can do up here. And so that I would say in particular, and then just, you know, having fl fun in, in weightlessness. That Kubla window seems to be the best window, well, not in the world, but in the universe, maybe. Um, it's time for student questions. Our first student is Mika Hansen. Please give him uh, a hand. Thank you. Andreas, my question to you is, what is your advice to students dreaming of going to space, both in terms of career decisions, but also developing personal skills? Well, you know, the, the basic uh, requirements to become an astronaut are that you need to have a background in STEM. So in science, technology, engineering, uh, medicine, um, that's kind of the key thing. Um, you also need to be a, a good uh, team player. Uh, everything that we do up here is, is as part of a team, whether it's the team of astronauts on board the space station or the entire team, uh, including the ground teams in mission control uh, that work to support us on a, on a daily basis. Um, you know, those are the kind of the two fund fundamentals. Um, uh, but otherwise, my, my advice uh, to any young person um, is to be flexible and to take those opportunities that arise. It's very easy to fixate on a goal and to think that you know how to reach that goal. Uh, but oftentimes in life, it's not the straight line that takes you to the goal. It's the, you know, the, the meandering path where you, where you take opportunities that don't seem to be directly related, but yet somehow end up affecting you in a way that takes you closer to your goal. So be flexible, take the opportunities that arise in life because it's very hard to predict what it is that will lead you eventually to your goal. Thank you very much. And our next student question is from Laura Esther Eising. Yeah. Uh, hi, Andreas. I, I was wondering what your favorite kind of experiment is to conduct on the ISS. Well, my favorite experiment would be one where I'm actively participating uh, in the scientific uh, process, you know, where I'm helping to make the discoveries, you know, using my hands. Um, there are so many different experiments up here, ranging from experiments just like that, where we're actually uh, participating in the process, uh, all the way to other experiments where we are essentially, um, you know, mounting uh, a black box, turning it on, and then letting the experiment uh, run autonomously in, in, in the background. Uh, but the ones where I'm actively involved are the ones that are, are my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Uh, Andreas, thank you so much for taking time to answer questions today. Um, say hello to all of your colleagues. We wish you safe travels around the planet and back down when that time comes. Give Andreas a big hand. Well, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure talking with you today, and I look forward to uh, seeing many of you hopefully soon when I'm back on Earth. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Stations, we are now resuming operational audio communications.